Chen Su Li, uh, head of the master, mathematics department at HQSD. <coughs> Uh, it is my honor uh, to have one of the greatest uh, in my profession, Professor Jean Bougain, <coughs> uh, the 2010 Shaw Laureate in Mathematical Science, to speak to us today. I'm also very happy to see so many students here, uh, including teachers and students from more than 20 secondary schools and sister institutions. The Shaw Prize is an international award established under the auspices of Sir Ronald Sa to honor individuals regardless of race, nationality, and religious beliefs who have achieved significant breakthrough in academic and scientific research and applications, and whose work has resulted in a positive and a profound impact on mankind. It consists of three annual prizes, astronomy, life science and medicine, and mathematical sciences. Each prize carries a monetary award of one million US dollars. Now, may I first invite Professor uh, Tony Chen, president of HKST, to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Jenshu. Uh, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all of you uh, today uh, to attend today's uh, short lecture in mathematical sciences to be given by Professor Jean Bourgain. Uh, he's a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Professor Bourgain will be speaking on pseudo-randomness and arithmetic combinatorics, a topic of multidisciplinary importance. Professor Bogain is one of the most brilliant analysts of our time. He has made outstanding contributions on many central topics of mathematical analysis. Mathematical analysis forms the foundation for vast areas of mathematics, ranging from uh, probability theory and statistical physics to partial differential equations, dynamical system, combinatorics, and number theory. Professor Bogain has resolved central and long-standing problems in each of the above fields. In doing so, he has introduced fundamental techniques, many of which have become standard tools in these areas. His work and ideas have greatly enhanced very fruitful cross fertilization between all these disciplines. A Belgian mathematician who has won worldwide fame, Professor Bourgain has been elected a foreign member of the Academies of Sciences of France, Poland, and Sweden. He has won numerous awards, most notably the Fields Medal in 1994, and in 2010 he received the Shaw Prize in Mathematical Sciences. The ceremony was held last evening, yesterday. The Shaw Prize is one of the most prestigious prizes that can be bestowed to a mathematician. Winning it is a testimony of Professor Morgan's profound achievements in mathematical analysis that has made him a living legend in the field. I want to add a personal note here. I've known Professor Bogan for some time. In fact, when I was department head at the UCLA, uh, uh, we uh, worked very hard to arrange a visiting position for Professor Bogan. We gave a series of lectures for several years uh, there. And we just confirmed that it's really. So I have a personal connection to Professor Bogan. Anyway, today I'm really delighted to see so many uh, uh, young faces among our audience, to see people in uniforms, I assume they are, they are students. Uh, I am sure that all of you will learn from Professor Morgan and come away filled with inspirations, but most importantly with aspirations as well. Besides this lecture, I also urge you all to stay behind for another session with Professor Morgan. Uh, and Sir Michael Atia, who is in the audience today, another great mathematician, and me, at uh, 4.30 uh, today, uh, at this lecture here. Okay. Uh, this will truly be yet again uh, an inspiring and fruitful experience for our young audiences uh, uh, today. Here. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it's my honor to present the great mathematician, Professor Jean Bourgain.
thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, before we begin our lecture, uh, we would like to present uh, a souvenir to Professor uh, Ugan uh, as a small token of appreciation. Uh, the souvenir is a miniature replica of uh, the carved mural uh, located at our Sanda Orient. And uh, uh, the mural depicts 39 ancient Chinese uh, achievements in science and technology. Uh, and you can find many of these related to mathematics. Uh, could you present, please? Well, um, let, it make, let, let me make clear from the beginning that, uh, say, my interests are really uh, mathematical, and the, uh, the applications to pseudo-randomness, they, they came uh, by talking to people in, in theoretical computer science. This talk will be mainly a non-technical talk, and uh, the focus will be on the mathematics which is involved. So I will, not talk, I will not talk about slot machines uh, and things of that kind. Well, a good place to start is to say something uh, about the difference between true randomness and what we call pseudo-randomness. So true randomness, this is what you would generate by an, say an ideal uh, coin flipping, which is an... Um, an honest, unbiased, uh, unbiased uh, sequence of, of, completely, uh, of, of events that are completely independent uh, of each other. Now, pseudo-randomness, on, 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 on the other hand, uh, appears in deterministic processes. So it is the random behavior of deterministic processes that has various uh, appearances. For instance, uh, in statistical me uh, mechanics, whether you believe it or not, uh, there is a Boltzmann ergodic hypothesis which tells you that uh, mechanical systems go through all states com compatible with the total energy of the system, uh, unless there is a reason for it not to happen. And say in, in arithmetics, in modular arithmetics, uh, there is what people have uh, studied as uh, arithmetical chaos, which is also a form or can be a form of pseudo-randomness. So let me repeat, we are not talking about true rand randomness, but deterministic processes that have certain features that, that look similar to what, uh, what is going on with a true random process. So some of the basic problems in pseudo-randomness are uh, de-randomization. So you have a true random process which is used for one or another application, and you like to replace it by a process which is deterministic and which does more or less the same thing. For instance, what would happen in a, in a slot machine. Another aspect is understanding randomness features in uh, various constructions and processes. They may be algebraic or they may be geometric, uh, and so sometimes they are put forward as models for, uh, for certain uh, random behavior, and then we like to understand what are really uh, the randomness, uh, how we can justify mathematically uh, the, the random properties of, uh, of these constructions. And I will, give you, um, I will give you examples. Basically, I will illustrate that uh, with some examples. And I will show you. Uh, not in, in detail, but uh, at least superficially, uh, some mathematical results that are coming from uh, arithmetic combinatorics and permit us to make uh, progress on these issues of de-randomization and understanding randomness features. So that is more or less the outline of, uh, of this talk. 
So, as you saw in the movie, the simplest question is how we can generate a process that looks like an unbiased uh, coin flipping. Unbiased, un unbiased coin flipping, well, coin flipping is never unbiased, but this is really a hypothetical thing, uh, really truly uh, random uh, coin flipping. So this is a problem uh, that, that, that has practical importance uh, in slot machines, of course, also in other areas like cryptography uh, or in, in numerical integration when, say, the space dimension is too large to really uh, deal with, with full grids because you, you would have to do too many calculations. Then you try to, to, to throw in uh, random numbers as a replacement of, of, this, of this big grid, and that's what you call Monte Carlo methods. And the way you, you produce these random numbers, of course, is, is not an, an easy matter. And that's, again, uh, an issue uh, of, uh, of pseudo-randomness. So the question, to repeat, is how uh, do we uh, proceed, or how can we pro proceed to produce a sequence of random 0, 1 bits? So a kind of the general theme in this, in this story is that if you don't have access to, to true randomness, which is kind of hypothetical because, of course, we use, mathematically speaking, often uh, random processes, uh, even, say, to, to prove the existence of, of certain things. But in, in practical life, we don't really have this, this true randomness. So if, we don't have, if you don't have access to, to, to true randomness, the next, bex, the, the next best thing you can try to use is algebra because there is a lot of complexity in that. So in particular, uh, these sequences, uh, which we call pseudo-random number generators, they are often produced by uh, modular arithmetics, and there are various recipes to produce these sequences. And what people, people are doing, are often doing, is testing the randomness properties uh, experimentally. So you have one or another way of producing uh, zero ones with some deterministic uh, algebraic construction, and then you test that they, they have kind of good randomness properties. But as a mathematician, what you also like to do is to understand a little bit why it has to be like that. And uh, this, this has been uh, my interest, at least in, in certain specific instances. So uh, von Neumann, who was interested um, in, definitely was interested in, in, crea in generating uh, random numbers uh, for various reasons made it clear right away that uh, considering arithmetical methods to produce random digits is of course nonsense because that will never be truly random. On the other hand, uh, the work, well-known work of Bloom Bloom and, and Schupp on uh, pseudo-random number uh, generators, uh, well, is based on a slightly more positive uh, view. And, well, what they put forward is that the, um, the goal of such a pseudo-random number uh, generator would be to produce from short seeds long sequences of bits that appear in every way to be generated by consecutive flips of a flat coin. And I will, I will illustrate that. I will not exactly ex translate uh, more down to earth what is meant by, this, uh, by these different uh, concepts. I will illustrate you that with an example, which is really the example that was studied by Bloom Bloom and, and Schupp. Uh, so when they, they say, look, that appear in every way as generated by uh, consecutive flips of a flat coin, of course, you have to be more specific because you're never going to, to, to get from an, um, a deterministic uh, process something which is, a, which is really random in, in any aspect. So you have to be more specific and also depending on the type of application. So two typical criteria to talk about uh, a, a good random behavior, of course, are standard, stat uh, standard statistical tests. So in the long run, the frequency of the zeros and the ones occurring in the sequence, they should appear, they should be nearly uh, the same. Frequencies should be nearly the same. Of course, that is the least you can expect. And also the zeros and ones, they should be well mixed. 
That is certainly important if you, if you would do uh, Monte Carlo simulations or things like that. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to use um, the uh, pseudo random number generators for uh, secure data exchange, there's also an issue of unpred unpredictability. So, given a finite segment of the sequence, it is not easy to make a better than random guess if the next element is a zero or one. Now, regarding standard statistical tests, there is quite a bit of mathematics that, have, that has been developed now to explain why certain constructions, they lead to sequences that, that satisfy the standard statistical tests. On the other hand, the mathematics uh, behind unpredictability is, um, well, it's often conditional. So the results that are uh, available at that stage, they are conditional to certain things that right now seem to be intractable. And in this discussion, I will mostly focus on the first, on the first uh, issue and, and not much on the issue of, uh, of uh, unpredictability. To come back to uh, Bloom, Bloom and Shoup, well, what they uh, introduced is the so-called X square mod N generator. Amazingly, this generator has certain similarities with the generator that von Neumann had introduced uh, earlier, uh, which is the middle square uh, method, which I will not explain you here. Now, this X square mod N generator works as follows. Uh, we take a large number N, which is the product of two primes, P and Q, which are about the same size. So you have a product of two primes, P and Q. Uh, the, the role, why you, the, the role of, of taking an N which is, which is composite here rather than a single prime, that has to do with um, the, the unpredictability uh, issue, which I, which I will not discuss uh, so much in, in detail uh, here. So anyway, uh, you should make it clear also that uh, the, the number N would be known, but not the factorization, OK? So we also assume that uh, P and Q are equal to 3 mod 4, so minus 1 is not a quadratic residue mod, 4, mod P or mod Q. So when we are taking X to be the set of quadratic residues mod N, so these are the residues which are a square mod N, every element of X has a unique square root in X. And so, what is this x square uh, mod n generator? Well, we have this map. Uh, we have this map t going from x to x. So we are mapping x to x square, which we reduce mod n. So we start from x0, that would be the seed. So you go to x0 square. You reduce mod n, which is not very difficult. You get x1, take its square, reduce mod n, get x2, and so on. So x1, x2, etc., are going to be numbers from, uh, uh, from say, let's say, from, from 1 up to n minus 1. And the actual uh, pseudo-random uh, number uh, sequence is a bit sequence of, uh, of 0 and 1s, where you define bi to be 0 if xi is even and is 1 if xi is odd. So since there are high school students uh, in the audience. Let me describe you an example, which they will figure out right away. But I doubt that here on the spot, I will be able to do these arithmetics in my head. But I can, of course, try. So we are taking uh, two primes, say 7 and 19. Uh, in practice, these primes are much, much, much larger. But of course, we keep it simple here. Uh, the, the number n, which is the product, is 133. So the x0 we are starting from, say, is 4. So the reduction of, of 4 mod 133, this is still, well, it's, it's still 4, which is an even number. So b0 is 0. So next, we are taking 4 square, and we're getting 16. 16 mod 133 is still 16. And the reduction, the, sorry, the, the parity is even. So we get another 0. Now, 16 squared, that already becomes a little bit more complicated. I believe it should be 256, if I'm not mistaken. 
And if I'm mistaken, don't tell me. Anyway, it has to be correct, but since if we do a reduction uh, mod 133, uh, the remainder, so if we look at 256 mod 133, we get a remainder uh, which is 123, which is odd, so B2 is 1. Then we are taking 123 uh, square, which I will not attempt to calculate in, in my head here. But if the calculation was then right, if you reduce mod 133, you are getting 100, which is even, so you get a zero. Uh, so next, 100 square reduced mod 133 gets you 25, which is odd, you get a one. 25 square reduced mod 133, it's 93, which is uh, odd, so you have a one again. Take the square, reduce mod 133, and you get back to the original four. And then the thing, of course, is going to repeat itself. So the period is six. In this game, the problem is short periods. So uh, the, the question, the first question, this is really the minimal you would, you would like to see to have uh, something that, that is acceptable as, as, a, as a random sequence is to have good statistics of the 0, 1 mixing. So what you see here is a sequence of 0, 1s. And, well, a good statistics means good distribution, which is expressed with a, with a mathematical concept of discrepancy. So how, do, uh, how is, discre is discrepancy defined? Well, you take any fixed uh, string, omega, uh, omega is omega 1, omega 2, omega r. r is fixed, say here r was taken to be 3. Uh, the, omega, the, the, the omega 1 and omega 2 are uh, zeros or 1s. So you can uh, here take, say, omega 1 to be 0, uh, omega 2 to be 1, omega 3 uh, to be 1, r is equal to 3. So we have an r tuple of 0 and 1s. So if the sequence would be really random, the occurrence frequency of that uh, word omega 1, omega 2, omega r, since all the, all the words have the same frequency in, in a perfectly random uh, setting, well, this, this frequency would be 2 at the power minus r, since we have 2 at the power r such sequences. And none of them should be privil uh, privileged. So discrepancy is the comparison between this ideal occurrence and the actual occurrence of omega in the given sequence. So what you do is that you're looking at the number of times you have the, the consecutive digits 0, 1, 1 in whatever the, the, the sequence of 0 and 1s that make up for one period. So ideally, this occurrence frequency should be very close to the true random frequency. And the discrepancy is obtained by, say, you may fix R, say, and then you take the maximum of this difference over all possible sequences. So now the question for a mathematician, of course, if, if you want to, to, wanna, to, to check uh, given pseudo-random number generators, whether they would be good or not, you can try to do this with a good computer and you do this experimentally. But then, mathematically, you like to understand what is really behind it. So you want to have some reason why these different words have the same length, say, have the same occurrence frequency. So a, a classical a standard tool that was used for that is the theory of so-called exponential sums. So it is a completely standard uh, mathematical practice to express this discrepancy on the level of um, such algebraic constructions by uh, exponential sums. So what you see here is an exponential sum with an, a polynomial. Uh, the, the polynomial is a polynomial of, of a certain degree. And, um, well, I will not go in, into details here if you don't know it. You just look at it like some kind of abstract art. It is not exactly crucial uh, to know precisely uh, what is the, uh, the, the exact meaning of, of, this, of these symbols. But let's just uh, remember that the goal is to get some kind of non-trivial cancellation between 
the different terms. So these different terms are complex numbers of modulus 1. And when you sum them up, what you like to see is a certain amount of cancellation, because that is a sign of a certain random behavior when you evaluate this polynomial over the consecutive residues. So there is a powerful result and deep result uh, available there, which is coming out of the work of André Vey, and will tell you that you can bound this sum by certain expression you see on the right. Now, you will observe right away that there is, there is obviously a trivial bound for this sum, which is a bound by P. And what you see on the right, it's not very useful when the degree gets of, of the same size as, as the square root of p or getting even larger. So when the degree d is getting larger, well, then this, this bound is, is completely trivial. I mean, it's, it's worse than, than trivial. So this inequality is quite powerful, gives you very good, uh, a very good estimate, but only if the degree is relatively small. And the trouble with many of these problems in, uh, in, in pseudo-randomness uh, coming from, um, from uh, algebraic constructions is that uh, these degrees are rather large and you cannot apply this uh, veil estimate again. You cannot apply these uh, this classical results, at least uh, not unconditionally. So, for instance, in the context of the bloom bloom shoop x square generator, uh, if you want to use veil inequality, you need a period which is very large, which is n at the power of 3 quarters. Now, basically, what we are talking about here is something like taking the, the multiplicative order of 2 mod some number. And if we, if we assume some, some number theoretical uh, hypothesis, which is known as the Gauss-Arten conjecture, and is unlikely true, uh, then we can assert that very often 2 is going to have a multiplicity, uh, is going to have a multiplicative order, which is going to be large enough. On the other hand, unconditionally, we cannot prove that. So if we are looking at the multiplicative order of 2, not uh, the, the smallest common uh, multiple of p minus 1 and q minus 1, well, it may be too small to apply this, this uh, vial theorem. bloom bloom Schupp solved the matter in a different way. What they did was to look at so-called Sophie Germain primes. So Sophie Germain prime is a very special creature. Uh, these are prime numbers with the property that they are of the form 2p plus 1, where p is also prime. So we're taking such, such a Sophie Germain prime, 2p plus 1, we subtract 1, we get 2p. No, 2p doesn't have small divisors except 2. So you have to be fine. There's no problem. Trouble with Sophie Germain primes is that we don't know too many of them. So far, there are only finitely many Sophie Germain primes known, and I mean, there is a possibility likely, likely uh, if, if we really believe that the primes are sufficiently random, then there is all the evidence that there should be infinitely many Sophie Germain primes, but so far that is certainly not proven. So anyway, this is the, the way uh, bloom bloom Schupp were, were dealing with, uh, with the question they took for P and Q Sophie Germain primes. So in, in any case, uh, where some of my work comes in is uh, the input of techniques uh, of a combinatorial nature that permits to deal with exponential sums uh, when these periods are quite short. So these exponential sums, they come with degrees which are too large to, uh, to treat them with something like the, the Weil inequality. So compared with the classical methods of, of Weil, uh, they give you less precise information, but on the other hand, they are more broadly applicable. And so far, they seem to be the only methods uh, to handle it. I'm sorry, just uh, for those who, who are mathematicians uh, here, uh, so let me just say that one of the uh, basic theorems uh, which, which was obtained, which I obtained, is in a way, an extension of um, work uh, which was done by uh, the number theorist Mordell. Actually, quite a while ago, in, in the 1930s, 
so in some sense, what is written here is, is a refinement of um, Mordell's theorem. Uh, what we are dealing with are Mordell polynomials, which are sparse polynomials. So compared with, uh, with uh, Weiss theorem, we are not taking arbitrary polynomials. In, in, in that type of question, these polynomials are often uh, of, of a special kind where they only involve a few monomials. So R here would be a fixed number. You only have a few monomials. So these are polynomials of a special, of, with a special structure. And that's how they often appear there. So we are able to prove results uh, of the same. We are able to prove uh, cancellations in these sums. Also for polynomials that can have a very, very high degree. So this, this, these numbers, these exponents, Ks, can be extremely large. Uh, the conditions which are required is that, uh, say, Ks should be, should be less than, say, P1 minus epsilon. You can see it like that. In fact, we need that the greatest common divisor of Ks and P minus 1 uh, should be less than P to the power 1 minus epsilon, which is even a more liberal uh, assumption. But the thing is that you should compare P1 minus epsilon with square root of P, that we are really getting close to P here. Now, this is not quite enough, and you also have to assume that when you look at... Uh, so if you assume that the Ks are less than P1 minus epsilon, you're fine. If you, if you put it like that, which is a more liberal condition, then you should also require that the greatest common uh, divisor between P minus 1 and any difference of, of distinct exponents... Uh, Ks uh, minus Ks prime should also be less than P1 minus epsilon. So here, epsilon would be fixed. P is a large prime. And under these assumptions, you have an estimate uh, which is not as precise as the, the Vey estimate, but at least has the advantage of giving you something under very, very uh, forgiving, uh, in, 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 quite, in, in quite broad uh, setting with a power gain. And that uh, inequality which is uh, stated here is quite useful in a number of uh, applications. So another small piece of mathematics is that this result is, and similar results are the product of a, a line of research uh, in combinatorics of finite fields. Uh, which start with a very general phenomenon. The interest of it to pseudo-randomness is that the principles are extremely general. Say, compared with, with traditional classical number theory, you are getting non-trivial results about objects which are much more general. So the, one of these general statements is the sum product phenomenon. So the, the rough statement of the sum product phenomenon is that if you take subsets of a prime field, uh, then uh, such sets will be either significantly enlarged by adding two, two elements, say pairs of two elements uh, of the set. And if it doesn't happen, well, then the set is going to be significantly enlarged by multiplying pairs of elements. Unless, of course, the set is already that large that you cannot enlarge it anymore. If the set is basically the whole field, of course, you can't do much. So except for this this obvious reason, either adding pairs or multiplying pairs is going to enlarge um, the set considerably. So for those who are not yet in high school, but are only in elementary school, I don't know if there are uh, some of you here, uh, that some product phenomenon is, is something which you, you get to, to see really from very, very young age because when they teach you in, I don't know whether it's in first or second grade, addition and multiplication tables, so maybe the addition table in first grade, the, the integers from 1 to 10, and then in, in second grade, you get the multiplication table from 1 to 10. Well, you must have observed something funny, is that in the multiplication table, there are many more numbers than in the addition table. So this feature, that you get many more numbers there, is something that is much more general. So the reason why you get many more numbers in the multiplication table, it's simply because you don't get that many in the addition table. So that's a special set, 1, 2, 3, up to 10. So what happens is that you have 
a similar phenomenon for completely general sets, which is a, a result which was proven in, in, I think, in the 80s by Erdos and Semirelli. And that phenomenon is not only true in the integers, but remains true in the context of modular arithmetic. So that is a very, very general principle that is underlying what I just told you. Um, so these are unpredictability issues. I will not go in, uh, into that. Uh, the unpredictability of the bloom bloom schub generator is conditional to the so-called quadratic residuosity assumption, which means that deciding if a given integer x is a square mod n is hard. Of course, if n is a prime, it's not very hard. But if n is composite, which is what we did, we took n to be the product of, of two primes, p and q, then, well, nobody knows how to do this easily. And the condition, the, the conditional statement uh, is that uh, unpredictability, this backwards unpredictability for the x square uh, pseudorandom number generator, uh, is a fact that is part of the paper of Bloom, Bloom, and Schupp if we assume this quadratic residuosity assumption. But as far as I know, there is absolutely no mathematical approach to, to handle that. To illustrate you another example where this Mordell type inequality is particularly useful, let me talk a little bit about uh, a cryptographical uh, issue, which is known as the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So the setup is the following. Bob and Alice, they want to set up a secret, and which is going to be some number. Uh, to do that, they have to exchange information over a public channel. And this information, since it is public, can be intercepted by an outsider. But it should not allow him to figure out what is the secret set up by Bob and Alice. So Bob and Alice know some mathematics, and they are going to proceed as follows. So first, there is a public base. Usually, it is a small prime. Let's say g equals 5, and every, everyone knows uh, what is uh, that public base. Then there is a public prime, and the public prime is a huge prime number. We take p equals 23, which is not very large. But again, for the sake of the calculation, we're going to put uh, 23 and, and large. Uh, well, uh, so now, um, at that stage, the 5, the 23 are public. Alice and Bob, they have a secret. Uh, Alice and Bob, they is called their own private key. OK? The private key of Alice is some residue mod p, which is, let's say, 8. The private key of Bob is a residue mod 23, which is 17. So again, the private key of Alice is 8, and only Alice knows what is her private key. No one else does. Same for Bob. Now, next. Uh, Alice in the phone book, what you will find is not her private key 8, but a public key. So the public key of Alice is 5 at the power 8. You take the, the base 5, and then you raise it to the power 8, and you do a reduction mod 23. So this is exponentiation, but um, it is reduced mod 23. So what you will find in the phone book for Alice is a public key, which is 16, and similarly for Bob, a public key, which is 15. So what can Alice do? Well, Alice knows, of course, from the phone book, the public key of Bob, which is 15. She also has her own private key, which is 8. So she can calculate, which is not very hard, 15 at the power 8, reduce mod 23, and get 4. On the other hand, Bob is in a symmetric situation because he knows from the phone book the public key of Alice, which is 16, his own private key, which is 17, 
And he can calculate 16 at the power 17 and get 4, which is the same, mod 23. Why do you have the same? Well, because in both cases, what these people calculated was the base 5 at the power 8 times 17 reduced mod 23. So they came up with the same answer. So in terms of uh, public information, what you have is the public base, the public prime, GNP. What is public also is the, are, are the public keys, G at the power M, G at the power B reduced mod P. What is private are the private keys uh, of Alice and Bob, which are only known to Alice and Bob respectively, and also their secret, because eventually their secret is for, which should only be known to both of them. So now the um, security of the Diffie-Hellman protocol is not mathematically proven. Let's make that clear. And it depends on several mathematical issues. The first issue is that computing a discrete logarithm should be difficult. Note that what I told you is that this public 16 is known. On the other hand, the private the 8 of Alice should be difficult to find out. So what we want, what we would try to do here is revert this, this exponentiation mod 23, which is what you call a discrete logarithm. So while exponentiation is, of course, very easy to, to calculate, even when the prime p is very large, the reverse operation is supposedly very difficult. This is what you call one-way functions, which are quite important in, in theoretical computer science. Nevertheless, uh, the the, the fact that computing discrete logarithms, say in the modular context, uh, is not easy, this is conditional and this is not unproven. Uh, on the other hand, there is another assumption, uh, which is the following, because you see, when um, okay, uh, outsiders, they have definitely access to the public keys of Bob and Alice, which are g to the power x, g to the power y. On the other hand, their secret is g to the power x, y. So there is another uh, issue, which is called the Diffie-Hellman undistinguishability assumption, which tells you that, say, partial information from this public key is GX, GY, is not going to give you much information about GXY. In other words, if we are taking bits of uh, GX, GY, GXY, they should appear like white noise. So again, uh, before, the, the way to attack it was through uh, Vale's inequality and uh, Results were conditional on having uh, sufficient large, sufficiently large multiplicative order, while uh, this, this uh, new uh, exponential uh, sum estimates actually permit to prove this indistinguishability assumption in a very, very broad range, even with, with, with very small multiplicative order, say, of, of G, and do without uh, what, is, uh, what they uh, refer to as the Artin conjecture. So um, what I described here is basically an application of how, say, new results in, um, in number theory uh, on the theory of exponential sums, I think, have their interest in their own because my primary interest was, was definitely from, from the number theoretic point of view, uh, turn out to have uh, an interest also in certain uh, questions that are coming, say, uh, from pseudo-random number generators or from crypt uh, cryptography uh, and also in other uh, issues from theoretical computer science I will not discuss here, which is the theory of randomness extractors, but I will not describe here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what I want to do now is to pass to another object, which is also uh, quite important, in, um, in particular in theoretical computer science, also to, to pure mathematics, uh, and is an, another issue about uh, de-randomization and understanding randomness. What I will do with the remaining time is go a little bit briefly over that. Uh, this is a theory of expander graphs, and tomorrow in my lecture I will elaborate much more on, on this theory. So expander graphs are sparse graphs with high connectivity, and they have many applications. The earlier applications were mostly geared towards uh, computer science, things like efficient communication networks, error-correcting codes, the randomization of random algorithms. 
quantum computation, or quantum computation is already at the boundary of theoretical computer science, say, and uh, real uh, pure mathematics. But then later, especially with the new results uh, one, uh, have, one uh, have obtained, uh, one has obtained uh, on expansion using methods from arithmetic combinatorics, there have been more and more uh, applications to pure mathematics, in particular to group theory, to geometry, uh, to um, various applications, to number theory, etc. And a lot of that uh, I, will, I will describe uh, tomorrow. But let me recall you first a few concepts. So when we are talking about uh, sparse graphs, well, we have a vertex set. So let's say that we have an, um, a vertex set which is quite large, say it has size n. On the other hand, uh, the number, well, the, the number of edges is relatively small. It's going to be proportional to the number of vertices. In particular, we will stick with so-called undirected k regular graphs where k is a fixed number. So for instance, k would be equal to 3. And that means that each vertex has exactly k neighbors. So we're having a large set of vertices, a large finite set of vertices, and um, for each vertex, they, each vertex has uh, a fixed number, say k, uh, outgoing edges, which is what uh, is uh, called k regular. The next thing is expansion. Well, expansion uh, crudely means that each set has a large boundary. So these are highly connected graphs. And the way it is realized is by making sure that each set has a boundary. Say so each, each set, which is at most say, half of the size of the vertex set, has a boundary which is proportional to the size of the set S. So what we do is that we take the ratio between the size of the boundary so the boundary you can define, for instance, as the number of uh, edges which are, going, which are connecting a vertex in the set S, which you would have here, uh, to the complement of S. So here you see that each vertex from the set S, each of these vertices, there are two. Well, that's a uh, four-regular graph. So you have two of the edges which are connecting that vertex to some vertices in, in the, in the complement. What uh, is called mat in mathematics as a Cheeger constant, it's just the minimum of the uh, ratio between the boundary of the set S, the, so the, the ratio between the size of the boundary of the set S and the size of the set S, uh, minimum taken over all subsets S of the vertex set, say of size at most equal to over two. There are various other uh, ways to express that, and I'll come back to that uh, tomorrow. So um, as a non-mathematician, it may, it may look strange, but let me uh, assure you that even for mathematicians, if they would have at least many mathematicians, even differential geometers sometimes, if you would have asked them before these, these theories were developed, number graphs exist, well, they may quickly have answered you that obviously they, did, they couldn't exist. They, did, they may not, well, they, they may acknowledge that they did not quite see the reason why they couldn't exist, but certainly by tomorrow they would come up with, with a reason why an expander graph cannot exist. And uh, actually, the first existence proof of expander families, so when we're talking expander, about expander families, it means that uh, we would look at graphs, say k regular graphs, where k is fixed on vertex sets which are getting larger and larger and larger, and in such a way that this Cheeger constant over the, the, this, this family of graphs remains controlled from below by, by some number which is strictly positive. This is what you call uh, expander families. So do expander graphs exist? Uh, the first time uh, it, was, uh, it was demonstrated, was by purely probabilistic considerations. Um, it goes back to Pinsker, 73, although tomorrow we will see that, in, in fact, al already Kolmogorov, uh, several years earlier, knew that these things had to, he had some reason for it, 
uh, had to exist. So what did Pinsk observe? This is not a terribly diffi difficult observation, but you have to believe it first, is that if we would take uh, a random, which is a typical k-regular graph on n vertices, where you fix the k, say take k equals 3, and then you take a random graph on n vertices, what happens is that uh, with high probability, they will have a good expansion property. In other words, uh, when n is going to infinity, there will be with high probability a control of the expansion coefficient, of this Schieger coefficient, bounded from below. So that is a way to produce such expander graphs. Not very useful from the, from the practical point of view, because really what you like to put your hands on are explicit examples of expander graphs. So here we are hitting another problem of derandomization. It's how to produce explicitly such expander graphs. Because the fact that a, a typical random graph is an expander is go not going to help you very much when you really have to put your hand on one. And as I told you, in computer science, there were uh, issues, clear issues, where they really wanted to have such, such graphs. So Margulis made the first uh, construction, again, by algebra. But for our uh, purposes, what is uh, more uh, relevant is the expansion in Cayley graphs. What Margulis came up with are not exactly Cayley graphs. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is a natural class of graphs which, which is connected to algebra and which are Cayley graphs on groups. So um, let me quickly recall you, and I will give you some examples. We have a, a group G, let's say a finite group. Uh, it can be a billion or not a billion. A billion is not very interesting in, in, this, in this discussion. And we have an, uh, a symmetric set of generators of G. So the set S here should be thought of as very small. So S should be basically of, of a fixed size because S, the size of S is going to relate to the, um, uh, the, the degree of, of the graph, so the, the K, which I introduced in, in the context of a K-regular graph. Uh, the, the G will be the vertex set. So the vertices are the elements of G. And then the Cayley graph, well, you will throw in an edge between two elements of the group if the symmetric difference is in that set S. So you're going to, to connect uh, X to XS. X is arbitrary taken in the group G. And uh, S is anything in the set S. So because S was symmetric, you have a symmetric undirected graph. And because we assume that S is a generating set of the graph, uh, this graph is going to be connected. If you want to have an expander graph, you better have a graph which is connected. So you, you, at least the least you need about the set S is to have a set S which is generating for the group. Uh, for, the group. Uh, for those who are at an early stage, let me give you one example, which is definitely a very bad example. You would take a group, which is an, an abelian group here. You would just take the residues mod 10. And then you could take for the generator set 1. And since it has to be symmetric, minus 1. So you're going to, correct, to, to connect 0 to 1 and to minus 1, which is 9, mod 10, and so on. So you get that kind of pictures. Uh, you can clearly see that these pictures, so that, that's a two regular graph here. Uh, this picture is, is not going to, these graphs are not going to be good expanders. Because look, if, if I take a relatively big set here, you will only have a, a boundary which is very small. So with these abelian groups, you're not going to have a, a Cheeger constant that is going to, to stay away from zero when the group is getting larger. On the other hand, you can go to groups which are much more complicated, have a much more uh, intricate uh, algebraic structure. For instance, you can, you can go to matrix, uh, to, to matrix groups. Simplest example, let us take SL2P. So SL2P are two by two matrices. Uh, the inferences, the, the matrix elements are elements in Z mod PZ, which is the finite field, uh, the, the prime field uh, Z mod uh, FP, if you want, uh, which we mentioned earlier. And uh, the so you take all the matrices with the property that the, de that the, uh, de the determinant AD minus uh, BC is going to be 1 mod P. 
So SL2P is a uh, is, is finite uh, group, and you easily calculate that it has uh, how many elements, uh, P times uh, P plus 1 times P minus 1 elements. So here you have an example. Uh, you take P equals 5, and you take, uh, well, you would take A and B, which are, uh, which are definitely two, two generators. In fact, uh, they do more. And the graph you see here is exactly this k the graph, except that you're looking at it projectively. So the inverse of b is minus b. This is why you don't, I don't put minus b here. The picture you have here is a projective picture. There is another way uh, to describe the graph, uh, which may be even easier, uh, which is by uh, linear fractional maps. Uh, so in, in that case, instead of taking for the vertex set the group, you would take the projective line over, uh, over the, the field FP. So basically, the, the vertices are now in, in FP with, with one more point. And if you go back to the choice of um, the particular generators A and B, on the projective level, what you're doing, it's very simple. You connect X to X plus and minus 1 and to 1 over X. So these are still, these are, it's, it's definitely a very explicit graph. These are very simple rules. Uh, in fact, almost as simple as the ones I described uh, here, you have one more edge, uh, which is connecting x to 1 over x, but this is almost as simple in terms of rules. On the other hand, when you look at the structures that come out of them, these are much more complex structures. And in fact, you have expanding graphs, which means that with p getting large, you have expansion. Of course, there's no way to figure this out from these pictures that you have expansion, right? So you need a little theorem behind that. So this little theorem was provided by Selberg. This comes out of Selberg's work. But what Selberg did was to justify expansion of these graphs only for special choices of the generators. And um, I will come back to that um, uh, tomorrow. The theory was that you have these groups SL2P and uh, you can turn them into uh, expanding Cayley graphs but the, the choice of the generators for these SL2Ps have to be uh, very, very specific and it's, it's a quite restrictive theory. Uh, Alex Lubotsky, uh, who is a well-known uh, group theorist in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, illustrated this with a problem which is, which is now folklore, which is the one, two, three problem. In particular, uh, you can, well, let's consider special sets as uh, one, as two, as three. So as one is taken to be these two matrices here. And in fact, you should add, if you want to have symm symmetry, you should add the inverses. As uh, two, uh, you would just replace the one which is there and there by a two. And then S3, uh, you would uh, replace the 2 by 3. So you can take these sets here. Then you can look at SL2Ps with large P. And you don't have to worry about, in the three cases, you get sets of generators. On the other hand, Selberg's theorem is going to tell you that with S1 and S2, the associated k graphs you get have a good expansion property. The problem with S3 remained open in fact, remained open for quite a while until we developed this much more robust theory of expander Cayley graphs uh, in groups uh, SL2P and others which are based on arithmetic combinatorics. So what we proved in particular is that, and this is completely general, if you take this group, say, SL2P, and you take any set of generators, say, of, of bounded size, so take... Uh, uh, two elements and then the inverse elements, so we keep the size of S bounded, but you can take anything you want. Uh, we like to say something about expansion in the scalar graph. So, of course, if the graph is connected on, on a finite uh, set, you always have expansion, but you want to have a control of, of how much expansion you have. So, what we showed is that as soon as there are no loops which are too small, say small compared with the logarithm of P, you're always going to get loops which are going to be of the order of log P just by counting, right? But if we have no loops uh, which are small, too small compared with the order of log P, then we will have good expansion. And it's a, it's a fully quantitative result uh, 
like you heard on the movie, I'm an analyst, so I'm not thinking in terms of equalities or, say, qualitative statements. I like to see something like an explicit inequality because in the long run, what really matters are these inequalities. So there is a, there is a way to estimate this Chigger coefficient in terms of what is, how small these loops can be compared with the logarithm. Now, there are various consequences. Uh, in particular, um, well, I mean, one comment is that if we take a typical choice of generators in SL2P, the resulting Cayley graph is going to have good expansion. In fact, there are much stronger conjectures around, but they will not go into that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we do like we did uh, in, in the 1, 2, 3 problem, if we start from fixed uh, matrices uh, taken in, uh, uh, in SL2C. So here we're taking an infinite group, which are two by two matrices uh, with, uh, over the ring of orientings. Well, let's take a finite symmetric set uh, lambda in SL2C. Now, what Selber was assuming is that the group generated by lambda in SL2C is extremely large. What he was assuming is that we have a finite index of what we assume is something which is much more modest. We assume that the group generated by lambda is not too, uh, it's not basically an abelian group, right? Uh, what we are going to assume is that uh, this group generated by lambda contains the free group on two generators. Or what is equivalent, that uh, this group generated by lambda is a non-elementary subgroup. So this group can be, these groups can be extremely thin. That will allow us to apply the previous result and get uh, for the uh, family of, uh, so if we do now a reduction mod p, so what happens is that you will look at the reduction of the whole thing, so SL2z becomes SL2p, and then you can take uh, lambda and the group generated by lambda, so you have pi p lambda and the group generated by pi p lambda, so for p sufficiently large, pi p lambda is going to be generator, uh, generator set of SL2P, and not only that, we're going to have uniform expansion properties. Now, let me just answer, uh, ask you uh, a quick question. How much time would you like me to continue to talk? Because I can talk for quite a while more, but I don't want to... Um, so, if I talk for another 10 minutes, that is fine, or I should make it shorter? I don't know if anyone has a very strong opinion about that. Maybe five, ten minutes? At what? Oh, but then I have a lot of time. Yes. Okay. So, um, what I like to describe, you know, is an illustration of the, the second uh, aspect uh, of... Um, say, uh, pseudo-randomness. Now, instead of, of um, well, in some extent, uh, in, instead of having some random object and then trying to replace it uh, by uh, an object uh, which uh, is constructive, is deterministic, and has certain uh, random uh, similar features looking like this randomness, uh, here the the procedure is going to be slightly different, at least the way I will present it. Uh, what I will do uh, in, in that example, and if I have time, maybe the next, is describe you a construction which is uh, completely geometric. And a priori, there is no real reason why there should be any, any randomness in this construction. But what it turns out is that th there is quite a bit of randomness. So what I'll talk about is uh, a model that was introduced by Conway and Radin uh, for um, uh, quasi-crystals, and in fact, quasi-crystals which are quite stoastic. So in a crystal, you have a periodicity for quasi-crystals. Uh, you, uh, you, you don't have a, a periodic behavior, and really the goal was to obtain such quasi-crystals uh, which, which have that have um, as much, as, as less periodic behavior as possible. So in some sense, uh, as stoastic uh, as possible. 
So uh, there are standard constructions of aperiodic tailings in the plane uh, that are uh, generated by a uh, substitution dynamics. And well, in there are the so-called Penrose tailings. There are, there are several, many examples of, of Penrose tailings. What you see here is so-called Penrose kite and dart tailing, where you use uh, uh, two figures. Uh, one figure you may not see very clearly, but one figure is going to be a dart, and then the other, uh, the other figure is, is a kite. So the way you produce these tailings in the plane, it's by, by some substitution dynamics. And they are not periodic, but they are not very much not periodic. What I mean by that is that if you take a box of size n and you look at the number of orientations of the tiles, there aren't too many of them. They are only growing logarithmically. So if you want to have something uh, where the orientations of the tiles is, is, gro is growing more rapidly, you should go to tree space. The, uh, say the, the group, orthogonal group in, in two space this is, uh, this is not good. We need to go to a group which is, uh, which is more interesting. So we go to, uh, to tree space. So that is the uh, construction of uh, Conway and Radin. I will describe you in a moment. Uh, to describe it, uh, as you will see, it is quite simple. Um, the tiles are all the same. They are congruent triangular prisms, but in different positions. And the goal is to um, obtain such tilings where no the number of orientations grow rapidly in the volume and moreover uh, with orientations that are stochastic in the sense that, uh, that uh, they are well, that the, the, mixing, the mixing in these orientations is, is quite good. Um, that um, you have a rapid mixing uh, phenomenon going on there. So it's not clear how uh, they came up with the construction, but anyway, the way it is, it is done here is the following. Uh, you start from the mother tile. So this is this prism here. This is the quaqua uh, versal tile. Uh, the measurements are one and one. And then you get square root of 3. Somehow the square root of 3 is quite important here. So the process is as follows. We are going to subdivide this mother tile in eight daughter tiles, which are going to be uh, homothetic images by a factor of half in different orientations. And then we're going to rescale the whole picture by a factor of 2 and keep going. So how is this division made? Well, there is the front part and there is the back part. The front part you subdivide in eight, in, in four tiles uh, with ratio half. There is the, the front piece here, and then in the back you have one on top. There is a penthouse here on top, and then the, the lower living room here is subdivided in these two, uh, these two copies, and they're all, they're all the same up to the orientation. The back, there is a division, there is a subdivision which is different. You still will have the front part, but then behind it, there is one which is adjacent, and then the top is subdivided uh, in, in two pieces like that. So the, the back division is different. And with this particular choice, what you end up with are eight uh, tiles which are homothetic with the original tile with a factor half. That is another view. I don't know if it is much more, uh, if it's much more clear. So you have this front part here. Then in the back, you have, uh, you have one on top, two below. Sorry, uh, I'm still talking about the front part. So you have two here, one on top. And then in the back, there is one which is next to this. Then there is another one which goes like that. And then on top, you have one and, and the other one here. So um, what you do is is uh, rescale the whole picture. So you rescale uh, the picture by a factor two. And then you, uh, you renew the subdivision uh, process uh, to uh, each of these eight um, daughter tiles. And you keep going and going. And so eventually you're going to have, well, after n steps, you're going to have produced eight to the power n tiles. And if n goes to infinity, it's go, going to give you 
an, uh, a tiling of uh, three space, which is called the Conway uh, Rabin quaquaversal tiling. Now, the question is what can be said about this tiling? So, we have this concrete uh, geometric construction. What are its properties? So, what Conway and Rabin uh, is that the uh, quaquaversal tiling is statistically invariant under all rotations. But this was a, a rather qualitative statement, and what people cared about is how many uh, orientations do we really get in a given volume, and what is the rate of mixing of these orientations. So uh, if we, we take n larger and larger, uh, with, at what rate do these orientations approach the uniform distribution? So one of the consequences of our work uh, with the same uh, quarter, Alex Gambert, which is now, in a way, a counterpart of the work in SL2P, which we did in the unitary group, uh, what we showed is that uh, there is an exponentially fast mixing rate in the number of n subdivisions. This is something which is very close to expansion, as I will explain you tomorrow. This has to do with spectral gaps. So we proved the, ex the existence of a spectral gap. Earlier, there had been numerics uh, on, um, uh, well, of course, it's, it's a rather daring conjecture. There had been numerics on what can be said about the spectral gaps. Because basically, uh, this construction process is associated to what is called the heck operator. This heck operator is non self adjoint. Uh, actually. But for some mysterious reason that nobody really understands, the eigenvalues are real, which is rather strange. In any case, uh, there had been earlier uh, numerical work by, uh, in particular by Draco, Sadon, and Van Weerden, where they checked this, um, this heck operator uh, on, on invariant spaces. So the invariant spaces here are spaces of, of spherical harmonics. So you can look at spherical harmonics of, of varying degree, and you can see what happens with the spectral gap. So the spectral gap here is the difference between the numbers which are written here and 1. So what you see happening there is that already at 258, the gap between the, the second largest eigenvalue and the top one, which is 1, is extremely small. In fact, it's the conjecture trait. Now, the, as, as a concluding remark at that stage, what they should tell you is that uh, the, the, the methods from arithmetic combinatorics, they don't give you, say, uh, quantitatively always very pleasing results. Sometimes what you have is just a, a gain of an epsilon, and the epsilon can be explicit but very poor. But in a way it is excusable, because when you see what happens here, the... the the gap is actually very small, so we are not talking about something like a Ramanujan ga uh, graph or any kind of thing like that. It's really a very small uh, gap. So what we proved is that there is a gap with techniques which are quite powerful but give you a lot of qualitative results. And it's not that uh, we, we didn't do our job well. It just turns out that the, the gap is indeed quite small. So it really shows you that there is the need for a theory to give you such, such results that go beyond, say, an, uh, a nicer theory, uh, which gives you much better results but simply does not apply. I think maybe that's a good time to stop. What do you think? Yeah? Okay. Uh, um, thank you, Professor Bourquin. Um, since uh, we are a little bit over time, uh, I guess we will not have uh, uh, questions answered and answers session. Uh, but if you are really uh, desperate to answer, ask a question, I'm sure our Professor Bougain would be uh, glad to answer your questions during uh, the break. Uh, now, before you go, I have uh, two reminders. One is that at 4.30, we will have a session uh, dialogues with mathematics giants, uh, featuring three of the greatest mathematicians of our time, uh, Professor Bougain, uh, President Chen, and uh, uh, Sir Michael Atia, uh, Fields medalist and uh, Abel Prize winner. 
I, the moderator will be Alan Moy, a chair professor from my department. Uh, so this is the first reminder, 4.30, about uh, an hour from now. Uh, the second reminder is that we have prepared some refreshments just outside of this room. Uh, so uh, go ahead and enjoy it uh, uh, during the break. And uh, we'll see you in about one hour time in this same room. <laughs>